Welcome to the Level Up Artist Podcast. We're your hosts, Adriana M.A. and Jackie Sanders. We are two art professionals sharing forward the advice and business lessons we have learned along our creative journey. We talk to artists, leaders, and art professionals to demystify the creative process and discover new ways to succeed as a career-minded artist. If you find value in these conversations, please go ahead and subscribe. This will help other creatives like you find our podcast, and you'll be notified when we drop a new episode every Tuesday. So on today's podcast, we are very excited to welcome Aaliyah Bonnet. Um, quick introduction, she is an artist whose art involves painting on improvisational quilted fabrics. Her work tells the story of a Black woman's journey to find herself. Her figures are representations of her and the women around her. They are Black women, often partially or fully nude, who take ownership of their bodies and refuse to be controlled by imposed standards of race, gender, or sexuality. Through them, she constructs stories of Blackness, femininity, and sexuality beyond the violence and hypersexualization faced by Black women in a colonized world. Aaliyah graduated with her BFA from East Carolina, East Carolina University in 2021. She has participated in various events and exhibitions and has been the recipient of numerous awards, scholarships, and residencies, incl including the Bed Stewie Artist Residency in Brooklyn, New York, and the 2022 Emerging Artist Residency at Artspace in Raleigh, North Carolina. That was a lot. Welcome, Olivia, to the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> Yeah, we're so excited to have you on the podcast today, especially after having studios next to each other. You're actually directly mm -hmm. across the hall from me at ArtSpace, and um, mm -hmm. Adriana is just down the hall from us. So it's so awesome to be able to like, see your work over the past couple months evolve and obviously get to know you and see how you really mm -hmm. inhabit a creative space. I feel like you're a very typical artist in that sense of just like sprawling <laughs> out. It's awesome. <laughs> I do tend to spread out, but I feel like that comes with the territory of making like six feet quilts. Like mm -hmm. I don't have a choice, but then also my studio just kind of looks like a tornado ran through it sometimes, <laughs> which is fine. <laughs> okay, there is a method to the madness. Plus, um, I'm glad that through the residency, we got to know of your existence, so to speak, of course. And then extra bonus bonus, I had fabric I had been hoarding for years and you kindly took it off my hands, making my household. Yes. Uh, I still have a lot of fabrics, but <laughs> it's okay. I take them all in. They're yeah, all like well, little babies. <laughs> okay. I'm glad that they could be, it's not a, oh, I'm going to toss it. And who knows what happens to this? It's like, no, this actually may become art someday. Maybe. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know. I think that seems extremely exciting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I know we talked a bit in the introduction about your work, but how would you describe your artwork to someone who's never seen it before? Um, I think <laughs> The easiest thing for me when people ask me what I do is to like I make quilt paint on them, just like the super most basic thing that you know I could say to get people to kind of understand. I think it's just easier mostly for me to show a picture <laughs> of my the like me you paint on quilts. What does that even look like? And then I'm like, here's my work, shows them my Instagram. <laughs> But I, I I tend to just say I paint on quilts or, you know, like a mixed media quilt or um, anything like that. Yeah, and it's it's fabric. And then on top of it, are you putting gesso and then oil painting on top of the gesso? Sort of, kind of, just to get a rough idea. Yeah, yeah. Um, it took me a really long time. It took me like a couple of years to figure that process out. So I don't always like to talk super, super in depth about it. Sure. Um, but I do prime the... I do prime the quilt uh, before I paint on it, which is it, like it kind of it really just it really just kind of depends on the effect that I want to get and how I best, you know, like what's the easiest way for me to get through the quilt, depending on whatever else I'm doing to it. Because sometimes it like varies, but most of the time I'm like priming it and then painting on it or I'm um, painting on a fabric and then applicating that to the quilt after with okay. like some other sort of fabric. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm sure like with, I mean, most creative processes, but yours, especially having that combination of very different materials of both paint and fabric, both of which have several iterations and types within those categories of types of fabric, the density of the fabric, types of paint, colors, interaction of color. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is an ongoing exploration that is, I'm sure a very rich and exciting conversation, but also yeah frustrating at times too like you're always a beginner when you get a new brand or a new type of fabric or texture it can be and it can have its like difficulties for sure because fabric 
my core. You know, like normally when you're painting, especially with oil paint, you're painting on something that's stretched, right? So there's like a bounce to the canvas that you're dealing with, or like the panel is super hard, right? But with my stuff, it's not stretched. It's just there on a wall. So I kind of have to work with the the fabric moving as I'm painting it. And then also, you know, I, I don't just use cotton with my quilt. Sometimes I'm using velvet or like some sort of weird stretchy fabric because a lot of my fabrics are like used that I'm kind of working with, uh, which also, like you were saying, changes how you're painting yeah. on it and changes what, like if you're painting on velvet or something furry, like that's completely different than painting on like something with a weave structure like canvas. It should, but it's it's not as hard, it, but for me, I haven't painted on canvas in like three years. So I think now painting on canvas is a little harder for me than <laughs> painting on a quilt, but yeah. I love that. It's almost that idea, at least on my end, I'd love to make my canvases textured in advance so that I have something to react to and paint on top. It's almost in a way you're doing something similar. You're giving yourself a tactile surface with all kinds of different qualities with it that then you get to react to and then you get to work through. Um, it's kind of like we've heard other artists say, uh, artists like to make problems to solve. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like we make it hard for ourselves <laughs> we do but it's like I think that's part of the excitement it's that or part of the intellectual challenge of what we do is creating a problem and then working through it and then coming yeah. out on the other side usually mm -hmm. usually Victoria sometimes it's just like nope we're going in a different direction but it's right. being able to adapt but with that yeah. I do want to ask you um you know with this whole quilting thing when did you discover it and how does it tie back into your family history Share with us a little okay, bit about yeah that. it's like a kind I'll, I'll shorten it because <laughs> it is kind of a long story but uh, essentially i was in school at ecu and i was taking a painting class and i was one of those students who liked to know my projects like beforehand so i was like friends with the older kids so that way like the, like in painting i in in like painting one i knew what projects were going to be taught in painting three <laughs> so like i could figure out like because my friends were older. And so um, I knew that there was going to be a project, like a portable project where you had to make a painting that was able to be picked up and moved around the room that wasn't a canvas for like, you know, some sort of flat object, obviously. And so I, I knew like, okay, well, I'm going to have to do a project like that. At that same time, I was taking African American studies and we started learning about quilts may or may not being used in the Underground Railroad, you know, to help aid slaves to freedom. Um, and so in my head, I was like, that's super interesting. I'm going to do a freaking quilt. And so I, I went to, I was talking to my mom, you know, about the fact that I'm about to learn how to make this quilt. Let me pull this song machine out that I've never used that she gave me when I was in fourth grade. Right. And so, you know, as like, we're, we're talking about it. She said, Oh, I think my, my mom used to quilt. You need to ask your grandfather about it. Uh, context, my grandma passed away before I was born and my family doesn't, well, it's not a family that talks a ton, uh, about like people who have passed. And so that was kind of one of the first things that I'd learned really about my grandma that gave me any sort of concrete like information about her, right? Other than the fact that she was my grandma. <laughs> and so um, I called my grandfather up and he was like, yeah, she's a quilt. I still have all her fabric and all her quilts that she never finished and you know, all that stuff. And so he lives in Atlanta. So I said, okay, well, can I have it? And he's like, sure. So <laughs> we drove, me and my mom drove down to Atlanta to, for, well, we drove down for New Year's, but we ended up getting all the fabric and stuff as well, which is funny because I met John Lewis during that trip. Um, and wow. that made me become an African-American studies minor. Like I was on the fence about it. And then yeah. I met him and I was like, well, just got to do it now. <laughs> That's, <laughs> so old. That's awesome. And, <laughs> and then That's that was also the same trip where I was just kind of like, well, I guess I'm just going to learn how to quilt and do all this stuff like for sure. And, as a painter, you know, you're kind of like, well, at least me as a painter, I was like, how can I paint on anything, you know? So like, <laughs> I had to figure out how I was going to, you know, start this journey of painting on the quilt and stuff like that. And it just kind of formed from there. Super, super That's cool. Awesome. And I love how, I mean, even just like tying it back to, uh, of course, heritage, but even like your direct family stories were being unpacked mm -hmm. um, because I, I like I have a very similar experience of like some families are very like abundant with like information about talking about people mm -hmm. who have passed or they they know generation after generation of well your great great grandfather did this or that 
versus a lot of other histories just kind of get lost or just not talked about. Um, yeah. So that's mm -hmm. really cool that then your creative process, you're also able to kind of unpack one of those boxes and rediscover something mm -hmm. about your own direct heritage that you didn't know before. Right. It's really cool. Yeah, which was super interesting to me too, just because I was very close to my grandmother on my dad's side and my aunt on my dad's side. So I've had a lot of strong like presence of like women in my life who have been very influential. And so to have that gap of like not knowing who my, like what my grandma was doing or who my grandma was, like that gave me more of a chance to ask my grandfather father more questions, you know, that gave me a chance to learn my grandmother through her quilts. And she it like inadvertently taught me essentially how to quilt. And so that was always just kind of cool. Like I, I remember I used to really heavily look at her quilts when I first got in and like look at the fabric and figure out how she was doing everything and stuff like that. So that was a cool way to create a relationship mm -hmm. um, with my grandmother, even though she had passed, which is why I think ancestry is focused so heavily in my work or in my work during that time anyways. Which is so cool too. I feel like with combining it with, I mean, quilting specifically, because I mean, you touched on it in your education class in college of like learning about the rich history with quilting and how it really is mm -hmm. such a labor of love and communication in many parts of history mm -hmm. to where it becomes almost a portrait in itself of that person. These were like stitched by the people you pick the fabric and so much of all art forms. Um, but especially that one, it's very personal and like showing mm -hmm. who the person who made it was. And so I'm curious with also then combining, um, you mentioned with your project logistically trying to get ahead of the class, thinking about how you wanted to paint on quilts. Um, but was that ever part of that conversation also of thinking about actual portraiture with the quilts or did, have you always done portraiture or is that something that's been more recent? Um, I, I think when I, I first started painting, when I moved here from Maryland, so I was 16 and I think I was just naturally always interested in painting people. Like I started with that, uh, especially because I wasn't taking art classes in school. So there was really, I really had no guideline at that point of what to do. I was just like in my room. And the only thing I really wanted to paint was figures. And then uh, like naturally, because I was black, like I was going to paint a black figure because that, you know, just representation of who I was. Um, that and like my mom was always, always very like in her, like growing up, we always had black art in our house. Like my brother forced me to take African-American studies in high school, like that sort of thing. And so like my mom wouldn't let me buy like Marilyn Monroe shirts when I was younger. Like if, if I was buying a shirt with somebody on it, it was going to be a black person, you know, just because that wasn't something that was common. And she wanted me to have people or she wanted me to be looking up to black figures, not necessarily, you know, white figures. Not that she has anything against Marilyn Monroe like Sean Monroe, she just thought it was important for me to understand representation at a young age. And so that influenced me very heavily into like, that was just going to be what I was going to be painting. Uh, so I was always painting figures, not that I was good at it when I first started, but I, you know, was always into that more so than painting other things. I love that. And I love how there's that tie in, not just with the textiles, but also what you're saying about having role models that look like you and kind of how mm -hmm. that has translated through and now comes out in your work because I felt the same way as a kid. It was like, wait, you know, Barbies come in not that many colors or they didn't. Now they do. Now they come in all kinds mm -hmm. of stuff. But it mm -hmm. was that idea. And my mom would try to push that through a little bit too of like, you need all kinds of role models and not just of one specific group, but all groups. Like for her, it was always mm -hmm. very important. You need exposure to everything for a bigger perspective and understanding, um, right. which, you know, means also like in art, it kind of opens that exploration too of all these different artists and the traditions that they come from. But also mm -hmm. I have a, a tie in with this or, or a memory that came up as you were like describing the story with your grandmother. Same thing in my family, the women in the family pass stories down to each other while sewing together, um, mm -hmm. whether they were sewing by hand or by machine, it didn't matter. It was just that oral traditions were being passed through and textile was the medium that was bringing them together to do it. So my great, great, great aunt, who was like 97 or something, you know, she'd be having several generations of women with her as she's like, and this is how you do this art. And this is how you do this thing. And then I remember back in the 1930s, this thing happened. And it just mm -hmm. kind of brings you forward to the kind of histories that may not be written anywhere. 
either. Like, it's and that's just- the important part of textiles and more craft based, you know, like mediums is that that stuff wasn't taught in schools, especially like with like a ton. It was taught at home, right? Now, passed down from generation to generation, which is why there's such rich history in the quilts, you know, that people are, uh, you know, like holding on to that their grandmas have did that they're, you know, and unfortunately, when it comes to like slave quilts, there's not, there's just not a lot because it wasn't taken as seriously. Like they weren't preserving them as much, right? Because they're like, who cares about a slave quilt when they're slaves? And so, you know, that's unfortunate, but you have a rich history of Black quilters. You have a rich history of knowing that slaves were quilting, whether they were quilting, you know, because of, because they're, their um, owners at the time wanted a quilt made or because they were doing it out of necessity to keep themselves warm, even after slavery. You know, they're, they're, the quilting bee was a, a huge thing that gave wages to Black women in the South to quilt, you know, and also facilitated conversations for the civil rights movement. So there are like a, a lot of rich history there that I think inspired me a lot as I was learning about quilting to make me want to keep going. Um, yeah. But every time I am talking to somebody who's a quilter, a lot of times somebody in their family also did it, like their grandma or their aunt or their mom, and it's getting passed down, which I also think is a, a really interesting connection that a lot of people who sew have. Yeah. And no, and that makes sense. And, you know, my story, not as a Black person, but as a Brown person, a Hispanic mm-hmm. person. And from the Caribbean, it wasn't quilts. It's too hot for a quilt. <laughs> right. so our traditions were passed down. They were sewing other things, right? Yeah. And like I sewed a dress, you know. Um, mm-hmm. But very similarly, it allowed for that transmission of information and mm-hmm. also allowed, you know, women didn't have the same rights as they do now. So it also right. allowed them to kind of talk to each other about like, here's my experience. This happened to me. I got discriminated against or somebody's mm-hmm. harassing me who do I talk to? What do I do? Like, it's also like that sharing of resources and kind of going Mm -hmm. from there. Um, and almost like having that power together, right? Like all what's that saying? Mm -hmm. The, the tide brings up all the boats kind of thing. So it's like that (laughs) unity, you know, that familial unity, Mm -hmm. that community, that sense of community of like, things may not be great, but together we can put our heads together and try to solve a problem Mm -hmm. of maybe there's like a troublemaker in the neighborhood. What do we do? You know, kind of thing. And then like, yeah. I don't know. I, I I love the story. I'm like, there's no, it just, makes sense. yeah, it just, it's like, I wish this was something that was taught in school, even as part of art classes of some of the mm-hmm. traditions that are tied in, like you said, some of the crafts and kind of, kind of like what yeah. that facilitated. It's not just the mm-hmm. making of the thing that was functional. There was actually way more behind that. Yeah. Yeah. And I am curious with that tie-in, I love how you were saying when like you're talking with other people who have a connection to quilting, you find often that is passed down generation to generation. And of course, it's the case with your grandmother. Is Was that an active conversation? Um, even, I know you mentioned not much about her was discussed openly within the family, but did like your mom um, invest into quilting or has it become more of a conversation since you've mm-hmm. gone into the creative practice? Um, art as a whole has become more of a conversation since I do it because my family is just not they're not uh like art appreciators per se like in the in the most traditional sense like they are not okay. I didn't grow up going to museums you know like I just so quilting yes it has been more of a topic but also my mom has no experience sewing either <laughs> yeah. and like neither does her mom neither does her sister right and so it has been more of a topic of conversation that has been interesting for them to have you know, like, oh, I remember my mom, my, like, it's like now they remember that their mom was like sewing their curtains and sewing their dresses and stuff yeah. when they were younger, which I think is a pretty funny to talk to them about. Yeah. And I think that's so interesting too, because I mean, um, I feel like as artists, we're naturally reflective and perceptive of the mm-hmm. world around us, our own experience, and then also looking for others' experience so that we can contrast our own to theirs and kind of mm-hmm. have that dialogue. And it is very interesting because of course you don't know an existence. You can't truly know it other than your own. Even right. if you try to see from other people's perspectives and there's so much growth and richness of conversation that can happen through that until mm-hmm. you intentionally seek that out, you only know your own existence. And so I'm yeah. sure for her, she's like, well, of course, like 
moms just sew things. Like that's just what mm -hmm. people do. Um, you don't question that that's even an option or not an option. Yeah. And so I'm curious, that is brings up kind of another side conversation, which is an, also an ongoing trend with a lot of artists we talk about on the podcast is those like early creative influences. And so I love how she was really making sure that you saw like um, representation at an early age and prioritize that. Um, mm -hmm. But with not prioritizing going to museums, or as you mentioned, like not having those classes in school, um, what made you decide to go to ECU and major in art? What was the catalyst for that? Okay, so I moved here when I was 16 and I needed something to do because I didn't want to be a cheerleader anymore. <laughs> oh, wait, what? My mom was Revelation. Like, yeah. <laughs> so my mom was like, you need to figure something out to do after school, you know? So I joined art club. At that point, that's when I had kind of started, you know, well, I, I got to, at that point, it was like, I need to do something and it needs to stick a little bit because I was kind of like going everywhere <laughs> up until that point. And so um, I didn't really know what I wanted to do, but at an art club, I met the art teacher, Miss D at, at Garner. And she was, I think she made me really want to just be a teacher because I saw, even though like I wasn't in her class my junior year, like I saw how much she was willing to take me on and just kind of be open and being, being, I still talk to her all the time now. And so, you know, that was a really big thing. So then it was kind of like, well, I'll be an art teacher because during my senior year, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And ECU was a choice. Like I knew at that point I was taking an art class my senior year. And I knew that that was pretty good. And, you know, Miss D was kind of like, you have some good themes going on, you know, keep, keep doing this. And so I decided I wanted to be an art teacher. And that's why I went to ECU because they had a decent art program. They have, decent is like a, like a, they have a very good art program <laughs> for a public school in, East, in North Carolina. Like their art program is really, really good. So I kind of lucked out <laughs> by being there. <laughs> Yeah, and I know you kind of mentioned some of this already, but I do want to dive in a little bit deeper with it. So um, we've talked about how the quilts came into play, right, and how they tie back to your history and kind of like the history of your family and then also other, uh, you know, just Black history in general, right? And then, so that was very appealing, and it all started with that project in school from ECU, mind you. Um, and then we also have the side of it where you're talking about like you were interested in doing portraits from the get-go now that being said how did you narrow it down because you could have done all kinds of different portrayals right like some people will choose historic mm -hmm. figures for example or they'll choose only family members or they'll choose um futuristic afrofuturism um kind of things how did you narrow down all these different routes you could have gone to the style and subject matter that you're uh, focused on now obviously this can this is probably going to change over time it does for everybody mm -hmm. but for where you are now how did you reach to that and how were you able to narrow it down I think it happened very gradually for me like I don't think there's a specific point in time where actually mm, it depends I was always interested in making work that centered around black people and moving from Maryland which is like kind of but not really the south in people in Maryland's eyes, right? Anyways. Yeah. And I was pretty close. I was like pretty close to the city. So there was that. And, and I was in an area where it was mainly Black and Hispanics. And that was the school that I went to, you know? And so I was very around a, a lot of Black people, a lot of Hispanic people. I moved to North Carolina and my school was like mainly white people. And like they were driving big trucks and Confederate flags were being waved around. And that was just very jarring for me. And it also was like moving here kind of like the first time I'd experienced racism very overtly anyways. And so, you know, I was just kind of frustrated with that. And I think that positioned me in a place where, you know, I wanted to make work that spoke about what I was feeling. And in my head, if I wasn't doing that, then I was doing a disservice to myself. And I was also doing a disservice to other little black girls like me mm -hmm. who are going through the same things who have no representation. So I was frustrated. And so I started making work about that sort of thing. And then I went to school at ECU, which is a predominantly white institution, which honestly frustrated me even more, especially being in a program that 
you know, ECU is a, is a great school. They have great programs, but they don't, in the art school of art and design, they didn't have any black teachers who were touching any of the students unless they were in a film class. There's only one black professor and he was in film. So if you weren't taking film, it didn't happen. That put me in a place where I was surrounded by white professors and white students making work about black people that they did not understand, that they didn't know how to talk about, that they didn't always necessarily want to talk about, which made I'm the type of person who will push back. And so it made me push back more. That's when I started really focusing heavily on black subject matter, because it would be easier if I painted landscapes, because then I didn't have to sit in a class and make them say the word black. Okay. But in my head, it was like, I'm going to make them say the word black and I'm going to make them say it a lot more than what they want to say it now that I'm feeling this way. That's when I started really heav heavily kind of being like, I'm going to focus on black stereotypes. I'm going to really make these people uncomfortable. I'm going to talk about the fact that white people love having cotton as decor in their house. And like, it really pisses black people off, you know, like just stuff like that. That was what I was going to talk about if I was going to be put in those classes. Um, and I'm sure, especially and, within and, that like academia um, structure too, I mean, with classes, it's like, okay, great. You have this assignment after four weeks, you have everyone critiques everyone else's work. And so I really mm -hmm. love how you not only, of course, you had to feel that like jarring disconnect and recognized it, but I love that you had that power and voice to use your art, to lean into it, because I'm sure it was obviously such a tough situation to be in to where you felt that, but if mm -hmm. anything, you, it was just like a spotlight on those jarring differences that we have in social mm -hmm. conversations that I'm sure mm -hmm. just like fueled that work to where it made even more obvious of, because of course, if you were to be talking with all other black artists, they may be able to resonate with the work more, but it may not push yeah. the narrative conversation. It was more of like a su mm -hmm. supportive community than almost fueling the fire of emotion right. that <laughs> yeah. Those, like people avoiding saying things would actually mm -hmm. fuel that fire. Right, yeah. and you guys know me, you guys know I'm very unapologetically black. And so it's like, you can't really have a conversation with me at this point without at some point me acknowledging the fact that black people exist in the world, right? <laughs> and you guys know me. And so, <laughs> oh, yeah. and so it, was, it was really, I think that being in that environment for four years made me that way more so than what I already was because I grew up in a household that was like, you're black and that's what you are. Don't let anybody try to tell you otherwise or whatever, like my brother, it's forcing me to take African American study class. Not really forcing, you know, I'm saying forcing, like it was a bad thing. It really wasn't. encouraging. But, <laughs> right, exactly. But recognize so, the importance for you to have that as influences in education and context. fill your world with that. Because mm -hmm. if society were to have it its way in the white culture that you felt like you were just immersed in in North Carolina, you would take mm -hmm. all the white art history class lessons and only learn about Picasso and this and that when there's so many other rich histories. Right. You Which is what to, I was that everyone doing. needs to be exposed to. Yeah. yeah. And I think that was another thing too, like in the art history classes, I was only learning about white people and it was pissing yeah. me off. The yeah. it's, you know, like it's when you're not when you're not in that category and you're forced to learn about it all the time, it frustrates you. It, you get it, right. And so it's like, okay, where where are my people at? Where are my people? <laughs> where are not even not even just my people, but where are the other people that have brown skin? Like you're just confused. Why am I taking American art and I'm not learning anything about Native Americans? Like it was just pissing me off, right? So it forced me to go outside of school to learn all about art history, which made me turn to Instagram, which is what, how I started. And I was just kind of like, why am I learning about all these dead artists? Like, I know it's important, but I want to learn about some artists that are living, that are making work that is speaking to me, which made me go to Instagram. And I think my, it's funny because I'm, my professor started realizing that I was act, like being like that. And so they would send me, they would like email me outside of school all the time, like different articles and different artists because they knew that I was like frustrated. Like they were like, I was like, I'm not, I think I emailed, I emailed like the Dean of the School of Art and Design frustrated that there was no African-American art classes. I would email my art history professors before I was taking the class. Like, are you going to be, I think I did this for, Oh God, I think I did this for American art where I, I was like, emailed the professor, like, I hope, like, are we going to be learning about like, you know, work from like black, black work, like the Harlem Renaissance, like, are we going to be learning about this stuff in this class? Like, da, 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 da. like I was like, right. I'm sure, I'm sure they were like this, 
this kid is like so <laughs> annoying. <laughs> yeah, but, but it's think necessary it's, though. Like art yeah. can be a tool for activism mm -hmm. and it takes, mm -hmm. it takes courage to do what you were doing, but it's necessary. It's almost mm -hmm. like for you to get the full picture of art history, it's not just old dead white males. Like there's so many people that were doing art all over the world. And it's not like you have to, you have to give a voice to everyone. Like our world mm -hmm. is all the colors of the rainbow. Like why can't you cover yep everybody like why is it just right. like, and of course you know if you dig bag you kind of find out why right like who's writing those histories mm -hmm. but um i love that idea that you pushed back and you said um excuse me like so um <clears throat> where's the rest of us like you yeah. know if we if we throw a very down, like that yeah yeah <laughs> but i think especially also, with it like was also hard it wasn't easy you know like it wasn't easy to do those things like i was frustrated a lot of times i shed a lot of tears after critique because i was frustrated that they didn't understand what i was talking about you know, like if you talk about like my friends, some of my best friends in that time, like still remember that time. And they're like, I cannot believe some of the questions that they were asking you, like the over explaining that you would have to do in critiques mm -hmm. just because they didn't understand the message. And part of critique is talking about the message. Mm -hmm. And so like I would feel slighted after critique because they uh, concept is very big in my work. And if you're not talking about con you're not critiquing my concept, you're just talking about the technical side. Like that's important too, but for me, it's like I'm not gaining as much, right? And so, mm -hmm. especially when other students are getting their concepts talked about and everybody's understanding it and stuff, I would be so frustrated. So it would have been, I feel like if I wasn't in that pressure cooker, you know, like I wouldn't have been mo so motivated to succeed, to be successful, or you know, to graduate and have things set in place already. Because I was, I, if I wasn't in that environment, I don't think I would be doing anything. What I was doing, what I'm doing today. You, you literally mm -hmm. made lemonade out of lemons. I mean, there's this, uh, there's this expression where it says discomfort is the currency of growth. And mm -hmm. you didn't just do it for yourself. You also did it for the people that were in the room with you. I mean, mm -hmm. it's not. Obviously, it probably felt like a burden sometimes to be the one educating others. But at the same time, mm -hmm. you actually stepped up and did it because you could have quietly just gone into landscapes, like you said, or something that was not ethnically descriptive. Um, you could have taken the quote unquote easy way out. And instead, you, you know, you just pushed through and then decided to mm -hmm. master it and like actually push, yeah. push forward. So, I mean, yeah. that's off, honestly. I mean, that takes <laughs> takes courage. And you and you were writing to the staff, too. It wasn't just the students. You were oh, like, yeah, I was super, <laughs> I was super like, I was like on my like typing emails all the time. <laughs> But you know, I'm glad about because you know some of there are some of my professors were super supportive and they not that they could relate, but they understood they or understood, but they tried realized what I was going through. Yeah. And mm -hmm. they, you know, really, really became a support system for me. You know, yeah. but um <laughs> yeah, it was pretty like like <laughs> you're like, are we gonna are we gonna <laughs> You're like, are we going to learn about black artists other than during black history month where we have two no, weeks literally. about it? Like I was, I was no. like, I'm sure. Yeah. Who knows what my professors were like saying? Cause I know I was being so, I, and sometimes I just didn't have the patience, you know, especially like it, it's not, I think a lot of th like people think that if we, if they don't know something, it's somebody else's job to educate them, especially in today's day and age where Google doesn't exist. But you know, like sometimes I'm not talking about easy things to talk about. And if you want to learn about it, it's you can look it up. Mm -hmm. And right. I think that was like one of the big things to me too, because before this goes back into your other question about making like figurative work and figuring out like who I'm depicting and stuff like that. Because before, especially in school or my late, like my earlier years in school, I was so frustrated because I was like, okay, I need to educate these people because they don't know it's me off, right? So I'm going to talk about the five black stereotypes and I'm going to be uh, extra about it. And then I started realizing that, you know, like I, if I'm, I'm painting a black person, there's, there, for me, there's going to be reasons behind everything that I'm putting in my quilts anyways. But, you know, like it doesn't have to educate outright. You're educating already because you're putting a black person or a person of color on a quilt. You know what I mean? And that's going to make, like at, at art space for sure like people come in and they see that and they're like what the there's this naked black woman on this quilt why and that just kind of naturally is makes them think and it became less about educating for me and more about making people think because i'm not i i couldn't keep frustrating myself and thinking about those things you know like black people have a dark history in america if i'm talking about black history like some of that stuff is not easy and happy you know and so i don't always want to be thinking about that all the time so 
now it's then it became more about like okay well let me talk about my personal experience as a black woman because other people can you know if you're a black woman you 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 may be able to get some of the things that i've been going through and talking about and that was that that's become the case so yeah yeah in a way it's almost like you're helping anybody from a underrepresented community whether they're black or not if they're underrepresented mm-hmm. in any way you are acting in a way as a role model for them and saying you can do this no seriously think about it yeah. like of kids that are looking up to you that are going like wow maybe I could do that too at some point or another like mm-hmm. like this is a path that I didn't know existed so it's almost like you know how you were saying earlier you were like well people can look it up but maybe they don't know what to look for or mm-hmm. they need something that triggers horrible word oh uh, they need something that provokes that conversation that just brings mm-hmm. it up and makes them question and goes I don't know anything about this thing and then they can right. look it up, right? But you're exactly. presenting them with the option to see the thing, you know, see the subject, see the question you're bringing up or the topic you're bringing up, and then it's the balls on their court, mm-hmm. right? But yeah. you're, they're just being confronted with maybe a conversation they're not currently engaged in. Mm-hmm. And you're opening the mm-hmm. door to, you're not the one having the full conversation with them, but I think that awareness right. with people, I mean, it's, even the beginning, we were talking about quilting of your mom didn't know that all moms didn't sew in quilt to where it's, Exactly. Also, then there's your existence that you don't know. But I think especially I I do think that you really are a role model for so many people. And I think especially when um, young artists will be hearing this, I know the frustration that you had in the academia space is unfortunately probably not uncommon, whether it's students in high school or in college and whatever void they feel like is missing in their education. And so I really do admire how you just one kept your professors and education system accountable by putting it in writing, just being like, this is what I want my education to be. And then mm-hmm. even when there were restrictions within that saying, okay, what can I do to empower myself and educate myself with my own creative influences? Like if I'm not going to get exactly. it here, then turning to contemporary artists and those voices of um, not, yes, I mean, history is an amazing place to look for creative influences and there's a time and place for art history courses, but mm-hmm. I love how you also embraced the contemporary artists now that are online and on Instagram. Mm-hmm. And so I'm curious when you were doing that, were there any key like figures or artists that um, I'm sure even now you really connect with that was kind of that building of your own education from a black contemporary artist standpoint? Yes, a ton. <laughs> um, I'm like looking, I have this bookcase in my room because I started collecting like artist books like just books about artists and their work and stuff like that so I was extremely extremely influenced by Kara Walker so good she's amazing so good Lisa Butler I was learning about who really really influenced how I thought about quotes I think um and who else Carrie James Marshall gosh I was just like influenced by so many art artists that were still working, Faith Ringgold, who I found out about in high school. I remember doing a project on her and she's consistently been an influence for me. And I still go back and look at the books that I bought. Who else I'm looking over here? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, and then like some of my, like, uh, uh, like my peers influence me a lot because I can have conversations with them. Like I might not have a, be able to have a conversation with, you know, Kara Walker. But I can have a conversation with, you know, Basil Kincaid, yeah, who is like a super big influence for me, who has been a great, you know, mentor. Or Ambrose Murray, who is another North Carolina artist who's in textiles, who's been super helpful, you know, and just, uh, you know, just talking to me and also just seeing their work is very inspiring for me. Anyways, you know, you know, like when you can see. With the bigger artists, you don't always see behind the scenes. You don't see their process. You're not talking to them about their journey. You can't. But, you know, like with the people around you, you can. And you can see what their work in progress looks like. And it and it, it, makes it makes it more approachable for me anyway. It's like, oh, okay, I can, I can do what they're doing. Not do what they're doing in terms of their artwork, but maneuver how they're maneuvering in terms of reaching out to people and how they're approaching their work, how they're thinking about their work, how they're writing about their work. All of those things are uh, sometimes more important to me than the actual outcome of their work because I'm, I'm, you're getting more of an insight. That's why I like my studio 
to look so lived in. You know, I'm I'm there working, obviously. <laughs> we're living like, there, basically. <laughs> right, we're living there. <laughs> I like for people to see what I'm writing about because that's also a big part of my process. So I don't necessarily sketch a lot, but I do write a ton, and that I think is important. Absolutely. And we definitely have that in common across the hall from each other. We have our walls of uh, of writing or like fabric mm -hmm. samples or a paint research swatches. wall. <laughs> yeah, a little research wall. And honestly, I feel like um, having community facing studios, we have that huge benefit to engage in the conversation with visitors or even having other artists come to our space to where mm -hmm. I find that most people are really gravitating towards that area, at least in my studio. And mm -hmm. I've seen your studio too, because that really is where the, of course, the end products are wonderful too. And we love having them in galleries and on exhibitions and the homes of collectors. But I feel like that is as close as people can get to really being immersed and observing the yeah. creative process of yeah. seeing those notes, seeing the scraps on the floor and the materials that it takes mm -hmm. to bring this piece to life. Um, and I love what you said about kind of learning and studying what um, other artists are doing now and um, maneuvering the way they're maneuvering. It's not mm -hmm. mimicking their exact escalation and career path, but it's mm -hmm. recognizing, oh, what were the decisions they made to lend them to do this? And so mm -hmm. I am curious too of like, how do you find and choose opportunities within your career? What's that focus for you where you are in your career right now? I am lucky in the sense that people reach out to me probably a little bit a, a, more than I apply for things. Like I don't like applying for things. And so, you know, if people reach out to me, great, because I don't have to do that. But, yep. <laughs> um, <laughs> but in terms of figuring, sometimes I do commissions. Um, in terms of choosing those, I, I still am a big advocate for your work meaning something, you know, and being able to speak to people through your work. And because I'm somebody who is really interested in social justice, and activism through your art that was kind of how i got started you know <laughs> i i like for my commissions or when people come to me about wanting to do a piece like if they want me to paint a picture of their their grandfather i'm like mm. but if a labor union wants me to do a quilt to kind of talk about you know fair wages and do stuff like that then i'm like all right i'm gonna do that you know uh just because i it has to mean something for me i also have a short attention span like i i can't paint your grandfather for 10 hours to make it look like him. Like I don't have that in me. And so I like, I like to, it needs to be something that I'm interested in. Also, if it's a show, you know, I, I'm pretty much, I'm going to say yes to a show, but because my work, uh, it allows for my audience is smaller just a little bit. You know, the shows that I'm in generally are catered towards the message that I'm already trying to put out there because of what my work is, you know, it's like, there it is a work about, you know, family dynamics. It is a work. It is a show about ancestry. You know, it's a show that is about, I don't know, you know, like just kind of stuff within that lane that already lends itself to pushing my narrative along that I'm just kind of like, yeah, sure. That's great. But also I'm a young artist, so I don't say no a lot anyways because I'm trying to grow and networking is as important as making your work. So if you're not networking, you're not getting into shows, you're not you're not doing, you're not pushing your work. So I, I tend to say, yeah, I'm, I'm in the first year of being the artist, you know, out there. And so I'm, all I'm doing is really saying yes and trying to push things, doing what I have to do. Like if I have to make a piece in four days for a show, I don't want to, but I'm going to do it because it's going to push me along. Yeah. We're going to order fun. Texas fajitas and grab the dog and camp out in the studio and make it happen. Exactly. <laughs> and then I'm going to make Jackie watch my dog so she doesn't bark. <laughs> I run to get a taco. <laughs> For our listeners who don't know, there's a wonderful Mexican restaurant right below our studio. And I'm pretty sure this artist at Art Space like are half of their money just from the free <laughs> that we know. We I wouldn't say keep, keep them, them open because they're pretty popular, but I mean, we're, we're a huge chunk we're of We're there. there every day. <laughs> I'm like, uh, yeah, I would need a takeout order. Great. It'll be ready in 15 minutes. Great. They Do know my voice. Thing? Yep. Yep. We're just upstairs. Do you want to get the going? usual? Yeah, I keep joking. We need to just have like a pulley system, like walk to the end of the hall, like put it in the basket, pull it up. <laughs> I know, literally, we run down there and run up. And I'm sure, yeah. like those people on the street are like, "What? What is that door?" I know, like it's like a, like the door that the door to easily get there is so indiscreet. Like you don't know what this door is that just lets you into the abyss of the world. Yeah, <laughs> just like a stairwell.
stairwell and you're like, okay, just go grab these. Uh, next, next yeah. Week. And I don't have windows in my studio. And so like, when I go outside, I'm like, oh, like, I'm I'm like <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for our listeners, just so they have a, a, a quick idea of what we're talking about. It's like our building has the main doors that most traffic you know where the public goes through but they're these side doors almost like I guess they were emergency doors back in the day or something um and on the outside you can't tell what they are but there's restaurants near them so it almost looks like those galley kitchen like back of a restaurant type door that you don't know what it is and us artists will come out sometimes I've come out with a painting apron still on whoops and I'm like just running to go get a pizza and then I go back into that door so it's like it's almost like the secret door opens you go get the food secret door opens again and then it's still like Yep. She ben, I definitely <laughs> look like some weird little hermit, like yeah. the time when I'm walking out, like one sock is up, one sock is down. <laughs> There's like threads of fabric all over me. Like my hair is in some weird, I don't know. And then I'm just like, <laughs> like, let me go get yeah. my food. And then I go run back. <laughs> yeah. We're still in our like mental bubble in our creative process. Just like, no one talked to me. Like, I'm not actually here. I just like, <laughs> you know, my physical body's here, but like, not really just like, yeah. ignore me. it's fine. I'm, I'm still I'm working angry. through a painting problem in my head as I go get yeah. the food, but I'm still in painting thinking. Right. Mode. Yeah. I'm like, why'd I have to stop to go get food? <laughs> I have to go do that. <laughs> What is my body requiring me to... for 40 minutes? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. No, same, same. I'm like, wait, why, why can't I just spend seven hours straight? It's just what's <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't idea. go well. But anyway, and then I'm like, why am I angry? <laughs> yeah. Why is my head hurting? Why yeah. is my stomach hurting? Oh, wait, I've been painting for how long? Whoops. I yeah. haven't drank any water or eaten today. Maybe I should like I stop drop. rage painting. Yeah. And, like, yeah. Have a taco and be fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm like, it's, yeah, our bodies are machines that need to be uh, taken care of for us to mm -hmm. keep making art, but that's preaching to the choir. So um, bringing it back to art, ladies. <laughs> food is a very uh, vital part of the creative it process. It is. Seems food to be is a life, theme. art is life, food is art, all the things. Um, <laughs> um, earlier you were mentioning about, you know, uh, little bits of seeing work elsewhere. So perhaps there's some travel. And when we're talking, like looking through your bio, obviously you've gone up to New York and you've done different kinds of opportunities. So um, one of the things that stands out, not just art space, but you just said the one in New York as well, is residencies. And I don't know if it's something that you're going to continue to pursue, but if so, at least the ones that you've had so far, um, what role have they played in your career? thus far? And how does the interaction with the public and environment different from a private studio impact your work? Okay, let's unpack this. So <laughs> I love residencies. <laughs> I love residencies. I think they're a great way to get the community to see your work. I think it's a great way for you to understand the community that you're in, like, especially like New York, being in Bed-Stuy. And I, I, you know, I was walking around, I was meeting people, I was becoming a regular at the bagel shop down the street you know like I was going in the grocery store and they knew me because I would buy like five carts of watermelon you know like that sort of thing I think it really it really impacts your work because you're put into a new environment it also allows you to understand different communities which I think is really important especially as an artist you know some a lot of inspiration for me personally comes from being put in an environment where I can do a lot of research because I'm I'm somebody who likes to research and I'm somebody who likes to learn and my work is fueled by that so if I'm not constantly getting things in my head I'm not I'm not generating ideas yep. so New York was great and residencies are great for that because it allows you to generate ideas um some residencies it, it differs. Some are shorter, some are longer. Like art spaces is a year, which is a it's a pretty big commitment to be in a space for a year doing that. Um, and also they offer different things like some offer more studio visits, some offer, you know, all the, that sort of thing and others don't. And so it's kind of like a give and take sort of thing. But um, as far as being in an environment where like your your studio is public is it's so cool. You know, I, I think I am a little bit more uh, private in my studio practice like I like to mute Jackie probably knows this I like to play my music and I like to watch my videos while I'm working and sometimes I randomly start dancing because I'm listening to music while I'm painting and like I can't not you know like stuff like that so or you know I'm stuffing a taco down my throat <laughs> well, while hey. you know while painting and then there's a person who walks by the window and does this oh yeah you I know? get those too uh -huh. yeah. I mean 
thin bite. <laughs> yeah, you have like chips and salsa in one hand, paintbrush in the other. Yeah. And you're like, I lost my right. shoe somewhere. I don't know. <laughs> like, and you guys have like a little bit of a privacy sort of wall there that you guys can kind of hide behind, but I don't have that in my studio. So that has been a thing for me is what it's made me realize like uh, there, there are pluses and minuses to it. Like obviously the community can engage with your work a lot more first Fridays or a thing, which are great. I like, I like it when I'm the one who's inviting the people into my space. Yeah. Not right. when the people are looking at my, cause I get distracted very easily. So if I see somebody and they're like looking in my window like this, and then I open the door and then I talk to them, it throws me off for like an hour and a half because then I have to get right. You get it right. Yeah. Mm -hmm, then I have to get back into the mindset and it takes me a long time because yep. I'm already a distracted person by nature. And so it, it, like I already, like my, my minimum of working straight is like an, is like an hour, like maybe like 45 minutes of being able to work straight. And then I have to take a break. So if somebody yeah. has like came in during my 15 minutes out of that hour, it sets me back, yeah. back into like that hour, you know? And so it's, it's cool. I think that's uh, something really beneficial to recognize with you as an artist, but also for like our listeners to think about, because I found the exact same thing with my creative process. And I feel like that's not something that is really discussed when thinking like our studio specifically, but just like public facing in general of it really does inevitably shift your creative practice. Um, and yeah. I found like, that's why one of the many reasons I really make a dominant part of my artwork very early in the morning. Um, mm -hmm. because like the rest of the world's not awake. Like, especially yeah. my studio that doesn't have a, a ceiling, which right. if you're a listener and don't know, like which is Instagram, thing. you can see it. I was like, I feel like I'm in a fishbowl sometimes mm -hmm. yep. because like the like you administrative offices are above us and they're like talking. You can hear them talking. Yep. Yeah. Which is like great. I love that community aspect, but you, it's very difficult for some artists like ourselves to get into that creative flow with those, even in just like potential interruptions, even yeah. if I see someone walking by and my door is closed, I'm like, I'm not looking at you. I am not looking nope. at you. I'm not doing it. <laughs> I do that I, all the time. I can feel your eyes on me. And, and it's weird because like, we're social people and like, we want to mm -hmm. celebrate our creative process where you're like, this was my plan time. And I have a deadline and this isn't what I kind of like set aside as hosting time in my studio, which I think that's what's and it's fun. a different first mindset. Friday. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a very different right. mindset. And, and it's so it's like first shipping. Friday is every day, but on steroids, right? right? <laughs> because like every day is kind of like first Friday at art space because we have those windows and because our, our studio doors are sometimes open. Mine are mostly closed, but <laughs> right. <laughs> like, but then it's like first Friday where you're doing it consistently for four hours. And that's like enough for me. You know, like right. first Friday, I, I like first Friday, but like those four hours car will carry me through the month. Yeah. You're like, I'm <laughs> like, good. See you next month. I work. I'm like, <laughs> see, uh, my door is closed for the next week. Right. Yeah, I'm okay, well, <laughs> that's a chance. <laughs> unless, and unless it's like a, I, now I do like studio visits where people are like, Hey, can I come to your studio at this time? Then I can prepare, but also with the work I'm making, I, I want to be respectful to my pieces as well. And in terms of who is, who is looking at my work, because I'm aware that they're black women who are nude. Not everybody who walks into art space is a fan of that and is, you know, willing to receive it in the same way that other people, like I've had a ton of people and the way my windows are set up in my studio, like you can, I can see when people look at my work, and I can see their reaction to the work that's on mm. my, on the walls outside of my studio. So it's like, sometimes they walk and they're like, what the heck is that? And then they turn around and walk the other way. Right. Which it like gives you thick Whatever. skin because then it's kind of like, I could care less. Like I already, I've already, I already know, but sometimes I will like look at them. Like I just saw you, I just saw you look that way. <laughs> <laughs> you will make eye contact. You will feel this. Yeah. I just, I just saw I know you, what you just did in, in point and then look at the person that you're with and point and make a face and walk into Jane's studio or Alice's or Jackie's like, but I'm, you, I'm like, I understand, to, yep. you know, that that's not always the work that is palatable to everybody. It's not easy always to see that. And you're not and expecting Aaliyah, it either. Yeah. And Aaliyah, it's not just because they're naked women, because I get I know. that kind of reaction too. And my stuff is abstract for crying out loud. Mm -hmm. And they'll be like, that's too pretty. Or like, I don't know what that means yeah, or whatever. And it's just like, um, I don't know. I heard this from another artist who was saying, when the viewer comes to your work, they come where they are, not where you are. 
So oh, yeah. they don't necessarily understand what you're trying to convey or what language mm -hmm. you're trying to communicate in. And it just kind of like, it's almost like this friction in their brain of like, eh, eh, no. And, and that's right. fine, you know, that's on them, that's not on you. I am curious though, with all this conversation, of course we have a lot of shared experience at ArtSpace, but I'm curious about other residencies that you've done. I know you were just up in New York and um, just residencies as a whole, as it's becoming part of your creative development. Um, how have those experiences been in comparison? Were they public facing studios? And then also kind of reflecting on that as we wrap up, like what would your advice to artists who are seeking residencies be? Maybe some things mm. for them to consider. Okay, yeah. So uh, the bed -Stuy Artist Residency was the only other residency that I've done uh, because now that I'm out of school, I can actually apply. Like some residencies you can't apply if you're currently enrolled in a program. So I've done two this year and I'm going to Pinland for their winter residency um, in January. What I will say though, like the bed -Stuy Artist Residency, you're living where you're working, uh, which was nice for me because that allowed me to like drink Red Bulls and stay up till 4 a.m. working on a painting if I need to, and then like go do some stuff in New York, you know, like during the day. Uh, so it gave me a, a opportunity to explore during the day and work at night, which I don't know how I slept, but that was great. <laughs> yeah, there's <laughs> a then, third factor, um, the sleeping portion. Yes, Bye. and then with Pinland, I am their private studios that I'm pretty sure are, your, are shared spaces, um, which is kind of like how it was for me in school. So I'm used to that. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of like applying for residencies and looking for residencies, some residencies are invitation only and some you have to apply. Like for art space, I applied for Pinland, I applied for the Bed-Stuy residency, it was invitation. Um, so that's something to look into. But then also you really wanna look into where, this, where the residency is gonna be if you will have a space where you can work that's important um if there's a stipend that's also important like the bedside artist residency has a stipend uh you know art space at least right now i think they're changing it but they didn't have a stipend but they offered free studio space so those are kind of the things that you have to think about and then also you know like where is your work now what are the artists who have done that residency in the past what does their work look like what do their resumes look like are they an emerging artist or are they are, are they uh, are they uh, approving artists who have a little bit more of a standing ground in the in our career you know have they shown at museums have they had really reputable grants have they done other residencies that's really important too like some residencies i've applied to that i've been that i got denied for i was frustrated like why did i get denied because some won't give you feedback you know on why your application didn't go through it's because the artists that they are they are accepting are not emerging artists they're a little bit more firm in their career that's something to also think about um and then also you know how will your work improve in that residency space, how will your uh, professional development also improve? Like, are you gonna be learning things? Are you gonna be going to do it? Are they gonna be doing studio visits? Are they gonna be bringing people to you? Is there gonna be a sale of your work after? Um, you know, that is there gonna be a show? Like, are you gonna have a show at the end of your residency if you're gonna be there for more than a month or two months? Or, you know, like those are all things that you should be thinking about when you're applying for a residency, not just for the opportunity itself, but also like, what are you, gaining from the opportunity and they the people who are uh, looking for you are also thinking about the same thing so they're thinking about if they their work your work aligns with works that they've brought maybe they've brought in too many textile artists in the past year they're not going to be looking for a ton of textile artists because they just brought in a lot so then you have to think about those sort of things too those are things that i've thought about i don't know if that's helpful no that is super helpful and it really helps to kind of quantify for someone like some of the criteria because let's say the residency has a nice stipend right and it's in a nice city well an artist may be tempted to try to pursue it without thinking of some of those other things like some residencies well and then you know if you mentioned it i'm sorry i may have missed it um may have like a teaching requirement like workshop requirements mm -hmm. hourly requirements yes. um some yeah. residencies will have an exhibition where the timing is really tight or what you're making the residency ends in the exhibition. You don't get to do it later. So there's like, or there might be a publication involved. Like there's so many other things that are tied or in. Community outreach. 
Uh There's a Uh lot of things that you have to think about. And that also goes in with taking the time to really understand how you work as an artist in your practice. Like for some people dragging their sewing machine and all that crap to New York for a month is a lot. Mm -hmm. And I understand that because I did it and it was a lot. But you know, like for some people, it's not that big of a deal. Like if you're a sculpture artist, maybe having to bring all your materials is not going, is not going to work for you and you can't do that. So that residency is not an option for you, you know? So you have to think about those things because like some, like it has to, you have to know your practice to know if that, if that's going to like work for you. Maybe the residency is an hour away, but you don't want to drive an hour to the studio and back. What are the requirements for being in your studio? If that Mm -hmm. studio is offered like art spaces, like at least 15 hours a week, is that something that you can do if you have a full-time job? Mm-hmm. I, it just depends and it depends on the person like there's no like yes or no it really just depends on what that person is willing to do yeah, yeah and I and think that's also, a great thing to point out too in terms of like you evaluating what opportunities are good for you but also understanding that those are criteria or getting in the brains of people that are selecting who gets the residencies those are things they're going to be thinking about like even just mm-hmm. the very simple thing of proximity if there's two artists in North Carolina one that's an hour away and one that's 20 minutes away, the 20 minute away artist might just logistically be able to be there more often. Mm -hmm. Not that that would hopefully be the deciding factor for them to maybe at least Mm -hmm. start the conversation, but those are, those are elements that they're also thinking about. Art space is a very heavy on community outreach. You know, like they want you to have your studio door open. They want you to be at most of the, like all the first Fridays, they want you to do classes. They want you to do that sort of thing. If that's, if you're not a teaching artist, that may not be the best situation for you. If you're not an artist who likes to work in a public space with other artists around, that may not be the best studio. You know what I mean? So it really just, it, yeah, it really just depends on all those things. Yeah. yeah. I like that you mentioned too, you know, that it takes, and perhaps this is something, you know, to wrap up that part of the conversation um, that ties in. It also may take saying yes first to learn, especially depending where you are in your career and how experienced you're with residencies to know what you do and don't like, because you might be, oh, being public facing would be amazing. And then you do it and you're like, "Uh uh-uh, this is not for me. Next one I look at, Mm -hmm. I want something more private or vice versa. I did it and there was no community Mm -hmm. around it. And it was just, you know, just a hole in the wall cabin in the middle of nowhere. And there was nobody around. And it's just working. I might as well have done this at home without the drive. You know what I mean? So it's also exactly. like, yeah, it's also like trying to evaluate and it perhaps, I mean, non-answer answer, but it's to say like, you got to do it to find out like mm-hmm. what you like and what you don't, and then kind of go from there. But I love that with that. One of the questions, um, as we near towards the end, one of the questions we like, like to ask all our guests is how do you define success as an artist? this is my career so I think I think about it a little bit more differently like I want to be me being successful as an artist is me being able to sustain myself financially you know as an artist without having to have two other jobs um and also you know showing consistently in galleries and in museums teaching my not necessarily my specific process probably maybe but like you know teaching and being that, you know, representation, like we were talking about earlier is really important for me as well. So as long as I'm doing those things, then I'm happy. I love it. Great answer. Great answer. So now looking back though, what is one piece of advice you wish you had heard before you got started on your creative journey? One piece of advice would probably be to, hmm, oh gosh, I feel like there's so many different things that I could say. But I think for me, I would probably say to to just start, you know, I think for a long time, I was a little nerd. When I say long, like I, I graduated a year ago. So like I was working through school and, and I think that, you know, like if, if I had been like, start that Instagram and being consistent, you know, start that Instagram, start that website, start that store and stop just thinking about it so, so much and just do it because where you are, if, if you start now, you're going to be farther along with more experience than if you start in six months, you know, because you spent six months thinking about it because you were scared. And now you've set yourself back six months because you're your own competition. So you're only competing with yourself. You're only messing things up for yourself. You're not 
you know, then there's space for everybody. So just, you know, do it. That's like my piece of advice I would give myself. Love it. Love it. If somebody hands you a hundred bucks right now, what would you splurge it on or invest in? It has to be something that brings you joy and relates to your art or business. What would I splurge on? Yep. A long arm quilting machine. <laughs> that would bring me so much joy. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. I would try my hardest. I love that. That's a very practical answer. And you may need a slightly bigger studio if you have that. <laughs> I know, literally. One, oh, that would bring me so much joy. Every time I think about one, it makes me start to smile. <laughs> <laughs> well, I definitely feel like you will have one in your future. I have no doubt. But it has been so much fun talking to you today. Super excited to continue the connection. Excited to hear about your residency at Penland and just see where your yes. journey takes you. Thank you. I'm excited. Yeah. So how can our listeners stay in contact with you after this episode? You can find me on Instagram. That's probably the easiest way to keep up with what I'm doing. And my Instagram is at Sweet Peach Lee and Lee is L-E-E. -E. And then also my website is www.aliyabonnet.com. And you can find me on there as well. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Aaliyah. It has been so great talking to you. Um, as always, for our listeners, our show notes will be listed in today's episode notes. We can find links to our blog and all of our other podcast episodes. And if you want to stay connected with Jackie or myself in between episodes, uh, share your favorite parts of this episode. You can follow us on social media. I'm at MA Art across all platforms. And I'm at Jay Sanders Studio on all platforms. Thank you so much for listening. We'll talk to you next week.